Hey, church. Welcome. It's a great day to be here. Great day to be in the North Campus. Great day to be downtown. South, let's just give it up for our family all across the city. Welcome them to church today. We're so glad uh, that you guys are here. Um, the uh, the Maple Leafs are on a, on their five day break. They do this thing now where where in the NHL they get like five days in the middle of the season. It's kind of a it's like it's not even a real job, but they get a five day break. So I had to watch football yesterday, but the Patriots won. So that's great. So all the Patriots fans, hey! We're going to get there. We're going to get there. We're going to work that into next steps. It's going to be part of your process into at least just a love for sport in general, you know? Um, if you've got your Bible, would you go to Proverbs chapter 29, uh, verse 18? If, if this is your very first time here, my name's Jonathan. My wife and I, uh, Natasha, we are lead pastors at Experience Church. We're just glad that you're here today, you're spending some time uh, with us, and we like, to, we like to take, carve out these moments every week just to look at God's Word because it is living and active and it's practical and it's applicable to our lives, and I believe that the Bible matters not just today, but it'll matter tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. It makes a difference in your life, and so we're going to start in Proverbs 29 verse 18 where it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Vision for your life is critical to your survival. And in our whole premise for this series, Pixelated, a pixel is the smallest controllable element in a digital image. And then what, what happens in, and you know, you guys have like HD TVs and, and 4K TVs and somebody's pre-ordered like an 8K TV. Like you get it. You, we, want, we want the picture to be clear. And, and, and if we want our, our resolutions, the things that we've resolved, if we want to see in high resolution the things that God has for us this year, we got to pay attention to what hap happens to the pixels. We got to know what happens to the little areas, the little moments, the little controllable components of each of our lives, because because ultimately, if 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 a if an image is to get pixelated, if something goes wrong with the pixels, it becomes distorted and muddy and blurry, and you can't see exactly what you want to see, exactly the way you want to see. And I just believe that God wants you to start 2018 strong. I believe he wants us to finish 2018 strong. I believe he's got a great clear picture for your life today. And I think that when we get to the end of the year, we're going to look back and we're going to be, wow, God, you delivered on that clear picture you showed me way back in January. You kept the image clear. You kept it clear in my heart the entire time. And so so we're, we're learning through this series, how to avoid compromising and all the little things that could muddy and blur the image and get us, you know, I, I just don't want you to get to the end of 2018 and be like, wow, that does not look good. Like I wasted another one, you know. No, we're going we're gonna to take hold of this year. We're going to make a difference this year. God's got a plan for your life this year. He's going to do something in your family this year that's never happened. He's going to do something in your work that's never happened. He's going to do something in the city that we've never seen before. It's, gonna, it's going to happen because we're going to take hold of the picture. We're going to run after it. Come on, let's pray together. God, thank you for these moments that we get to spend together. We love you. We're excited that you're here because you make all the difference. Help us to see your son Jesus, know a little more about him, and to draw closer to him today. In his name, amen. Amen. Uh, I, was, I was talking to my wife this week, as I'm prone to do every now and then. We, we converse, um, and, uh, and I, I was like, hey, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about my sermon on Sunday, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chat with the church, and, and I'm thinking about disappointment, and I've been trying to think, like, are there any moments in our relationship where I, and I can't think of anything in our relationship that's really disappointed me? And I was struggling. I'm like, I just don't know. I'm like, can you help me think of some things? Or is there like, I mean, probably not, but is there any way that I've disappointed you? And she just goes for it. Like... <laughs> She, it's like she had a list ready, you know. She's like, oh, well, um, you know, right when we got married. And I was like, well, careful. <laughs> I know that was not disappointing. She's no, no, in the first, in the, come on, in the, in the, in that early season of marriage, she said, you know, like, um, I was 22 and I was young and full of life and you were 26 and you were slowing down. And she's like, I wasn't slowing down. She's like, well, I just, 
I thought that we were going to adventure a lot, and then the weekend would come, and you just kind of wanted to stay home and just be around the house and just hang out. She's like, I wanted to go see the city, and I wanted to do stuff. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me? You know, like, I, wow, I'm really sorry. Like, really? You're still thinking about that. It's been 13 years, and you're still holding on to that. Sorry to disappoint you. And she, but she wasn't, she wasn't done, of course. She's like, our second Valentine's Day, we were saving money. And so we said we weren't going to do anything for Valentine's. But then you actually didn't do anything for Valentine's. And I was so hurt by that. I'm like, it's because we said we weren't going to do anything for Valentine's. That's 12 years ago. She's like, I know, but I was, you asked me for a moment. She's like, and then, you know, something that's really just kind of disappointed me like the whole time is that, um, and I'm like, wow, slow it down. She's like, no, I've, I just, I'm really disappointed that you don't drink coffee. I'm like, well, that's stupid. Yes, of course. You go ahead. Be disappointed that I'm not addicted to some sort of drug. That's okay. It's fine. And she says, no, because, like, I love coffee. And I kind of, I kind of just always thought that me and my husband, you know, we'd go to cool cities and we'd find nice little cafes and we'd experience unique coffees together. And she said, you don't ever want to go to cafes. And when we do go to cafes, you think my drink smells bad and you get water. She's like, it's just, it's so disappointing. I'm like, well, I'm sorry. And then, I'm, you know, my parents have been here the last few weeks and they're, I mean, they basically survive off coffee, and so she's, she brings it up to me. She's like, well, I just watched the way your dad loves your mom. And I'm like, what? She's like, well, he gets up in the morning, and the first thing he does is he makes her a coffee. When was the last time he made me a coffee? In the middle of the, like, it's not even 10. She's still working on her first coffee, and he's already gone for a drive to Starbucks to get her another one. She's always taking care of him. And they always go out for coffee, and then I was like, enough! Can't handle it! I wrote a song for you! Says, let it go, let it go. I'm like, this is unbelievable! Like, can we not? I'm sorry, so sorry to disappoint you. And so we've, we've had to now, in our relationship, figure out how she can move forward, forward with such incredible disappointment and unmet expectations. And of course, I stand before you today, a shell of a man, having been gutted this week by all the ways I've failed my spouse. We're looking for a married small group, so if you're leading one, let me know. But it's just like, really? And, and, and so, you know, I, I'm trying to lead her through her disappointment. I'm like, babe, you know, the disappointment really becomes an issue when, when it becomes a distraction. Don't, don't let your disappointment in my lack of coffee love and the fact that I didn't get you a Valentine's Day card 12 years ago. Don't, don't become so distracted by those things that you miss all the gifts, like my physique and my charm and my humor. Like, don't, don't be so distracted by disappointment that you miss out on all the good stuff. And, and, and there is in this a certain element of truth. Now, now, all of those things that she told me are true. But, but even beyond that, disappointment is a dangerous emotion. Disappointment is a dangerous thing to feel because di disappointment, the, the experience of having unmet expectations, unfulfilled hope, unanswered prayer. I mean, the reality is you might not be disappointed in this moment, but you will walk through seasons of disappointment in your life. And if you don't know how to handle it and you don't know how to walk through it and you don't know how to process it, disappointment could very well take you out of your destiny. See, because di disappointment, it's a scary thing. I mean, you get distracted, and then and, and you start getting distracted from what matters, and you, your, your focus isn't right, and the picture starts to become blurry, and you miss what God's got for you, and then, and then you, you grow discontent with what you've got, and, and discontent can lead to disengagement, and then you start to disengage. And, and then when you, when you start to disengage from the things God's put before you, from the things God's created you for, that is a dangerous place to be. I mean, just... Just ask 
King David in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. I mean, the Bible says when all the kings went out to war, David remained in Jerusalem. He disengaged. He was a king. He should have been at war, but he disengaged. And so then he's out on his balcony just disengaging with what he should be doing and engaging with his eyes, watching a young woman have a bath. And he says, man, I like her a lot. And so then he has sex with her, and then she has a baby, and then he kills her husband. Like, disengagement will destroy you. And it all starts with that little emotion of being disappointed. And so what, what I want to do today, knowing that there are people in the room and your life doesn't look like what you hoped it would look like today, knowing that there are people in the room and without a doubt you will walk through some seasons of deep disappointment. How do we, in 2018, how do we, how do we see the picture of the destiny God's created us for? How do we, how do we see that with such clarity and, and run after it with such intensity that even disappointment doesn't slow us down? How do you defeat disappointment? There's a, there's a story. We are following the journey of Joshua as he leads the Israelites into the promised land. And so I want to I take it today from Joshua chapter 2. And uh, Joshua, a little interesting bit of information it says, then Joshua, son of Nun, he had no parents. Uh, Bible jokes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. Joshua has been given leadership of the Israelite people. He's taken over from Moses after his death. He is the boss. He's the commander-in-chief. He's laid out a plan. He's rallied the troops. They're standing on one side of the river. On the other side is a fortified city named Jericho, which is the gateway city to the promised land that God has said will be theirs should they Obey him and go for it. Jericho's right there. If they could take Jericho, they can have the rest of Canaan, but Jericho stands in the way. So Joshua knows that before he can send in the troops and, 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 and launch the attack, he's got to do a little bit of recon. And so he sends out a couple of spies to go investigate Jericho. It's a recon mission because sometimes... God's promises require our planning, right? Like you've got to participate in, in the whole process. Sometimes God promises financial freedom, but you've got you've to plan your finances out well. He, he promises things to you, but you've got to plan and be involved. And so the spies head in. They, they start scaling the wall, and they slip through a window and end up in the establishment of a harlot named Rahab. Rahab the prostitute. This was not, they did not stumble into the lobby of a Holiday Inn. The spies, the spies show up and they're in the middle of a brothel. And, and see, um, on the outside of the city, uh, there's a wall. And so the best way to get into the city is not to try go th going through the gate because, see, the king of Jericho and all its people know that the Israelites are positioned on the other side of the river. So the best way to go through is to try and get in through the wall. And, and Rahab's, Rahab's little business, little home business, is, is functioning out of an apartment she has right on the outside wall of the city. This woman is on the outside edge of the city. She's on the outside edge of society. She's been marginalized because of her pro uh, profession, because of her gender. She is second class. She's been treated as a commodity. Her body has become a vending machine for every lustful desire of every wandering traveler and every secret sin of the residents of her city. This is Rahab. We don't know why she ended up in the sex industry. Maybe she was kidnapped and forced into it. Maybe she had a husband who passed away and it was uh, a means of survival. Maybe it was something she chose for herself. Maybe she suffered abuse as a child. We have no idea uh, what happened in Rahab's life to bring her to this point. She literally enters the narrative of Scripture as Rahab the prostitute. This is all the context we have. But if, if you know much about the sex trade and sex workers, I was reading this week that, that just about 90% of women in North America involved in the sex trade in some ways, uh, in some way, sexual servicing, wish they could get out. They just don't have the means to do it. See, there's no way that Rahab is living the dream. 
I'm sure somewhere along the line she had hopes for her life. She had ambitions for her life. I mean, little girls dream of being princesses, not prostitutes. There's no, there's no question in my mind that this isn't where she wanted to end up. She probably had dreams of a husband and children and a family and, and all of these great things. And so we find this woman dropped into the story of Scripture, uh, unfulfilled, Unmet expectations, no doubt broken, suffering from deep disappointment herself. She's got to feel let down by how her story has played out to this point. See, the the interesting thing about Rahab, though, is this is the beginning of her story. And so as much as we see this woman um, totally... uh, damaged and ostracized and and all of the things that go with her life at this point, she is in Scripture one of the most powerful pictures of redemption. Because she she starts this way, but she doesn't finish this way. In fact, and and we're gonna we're gonna read some of her story, but 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 it's so incredible that like this was her beginning, but it wasn't her ending. See, um, she would survive the invasion of Jericho by the Israelites. It's just her and her family, the only ones from the city that would make it out. She would go on then to marry uh, Salmon, who was the son of Judah's military commander. So she just marries into a high-ranking official in the Israelite nation. She would, uh, not, not only that, but then, I mean, you fast forward to the New Testament. Rahab doesn't go away. I mean, she's just there multiple times through the Old and New Testament being referenced back in Hebrews chapter 11. Rahab is mentioned as a hero of the faith, calling people like us, man, have faith like Rahab had. James uh, talks about Rahab. James, the brother of Jesus, writes about her and says, man, we, we need to praise Rahab. He honors Rahab for how diligent she put her faith to work. But she started as a prostitute, forgotten, living on the edge of a city that was about to be destroyed. See, she begins the narrative as a, like, just think about this, the, like, how far she's come. She begins the story in Scripture as a prostitute and ends her story mentioned with the patriarchs of the faith, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who, who, At the time that she was living this out and living in prostitution, it would have been sinful for her to even have any affiliation with the patriarchs. Yet, by the time the Bible is over, like, man, you should be like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Rahab. Like, she's right there with the legends. Man, God is so incredibly redemptive. Why the turnaround? I think God wants you to know this morning that disappointment is never final. That as disappointed as you might be, as broken as you might feel, as tough as seasons and storms might seem, they are never the end game. So don't let disappointment, don't let disappointment, don't let what you've gone through derail you from the destiny God's prepared you for. Don't let it pixelate the picture he's got for your future. Pixelate the picture add another P in there somewhere. Don't let them pixelate the perfect picture that Peter Piper picked up. Okay. (laughs) Don't let them do it. And here's the thing. Uh, uh, you, You might not be Rahab. You might not be running a brothel on the east side of the city. You know, you're out there in Strathmore somewhere. Love Strathmore. But I think everybody in the room can relate to being let down. I think at some point, in some way, you can relate to unmet expectations. I think at some point, in some way, you can relate to unanswered prayers. I think in some way, in some, at some point, in some way, you can relate to unfulfilled hopes, where the story of your life and what you're seeing right now just isn't what you thought it would be, should be, could be, what you wanted it to be. And so, so what do we have to learn from Rahab? And see, this is so important because there are some of you, even, even last week as we started this series, we were talking about, like, man, God's got a picture, and it's awesome, and it's so great. Some of you are sitting in the room, and you're listening, and you're like, man, I, like, I can't see the picture of my future because I can't see past the pain of my present. Well, how do we get through the moment to lay hold of what God created you for? See, for Rahab, her house is on the outer, outside wall of Jericho, like I said. 
And the truth is, had she just stayed in her disappointment, had she just stayed in who she was in the moment, had she not changed, had she not been open to all that God had for her, when the Israelites came in and the walls fell down, she would have fell down with them. Yet she makes it out. A story of redemption. How do you keep the picture clear? How do you deal with disappointment? God's given you a picture, but then I believe he's also given you some other things to help you navigate when life gets tough. A couple things we can learn from Rahab. The first thing, God gives you a picture. You need to know that he also then will give you a purpose. God doesn't give you a picture and just, just dangle it out in front of you and say, good luck. He gives you a picture, but then he, he, he deposits purpose and value in your life. See, as unclear as the future might seem, at this point for Rahab, God had a plan for her. It's amazing because Joshua... And we talked about this a little bit last week. Joshua means God saves, and it's a Hebrew name. In the Greek, it's Jesus. It also means God saves or salvation. And so salvation sends for Rahab. Joshua says, hey, spies, I need you to go into the city, and, and, and I want you to check some things out for me, especially Jericho. Go scope it out. So she lives in the wall. Like, you can't tell me it's just random that of all the windows that would have been on the outside wall, the possible entrances through the city, the secret access points, that they happened to climb through the window of Rahab the prostitute. Like, like it just so happened that way. What was the conversation between the two spies? I don't know how they got up there. Maybe like a hook, climbing up the wall. They get up, they look in. They're like, dude, my wife is not going to be pumped about this. We got to go. They get up. This is it. They, they end up, they just like show up in Rahab's house. They can't go through the front gates. I mean, you just got to understand, things like this don't just happen by accident. God, God doesn't drop people into your life by accident. God doesn't set up relationships by accident. God doesn't cross your paths with other people by accident. That, that you are here today because of a, it just so happened moment. You know, when I even look back on my own personal history, there were, it just so happened moments even before I was born. I think it was 1975. My mom was just young, I don't, like 19 or something, and she was working at a bank, and it just so happened that a Christian woman worked in the thing next to her and told her about Jesus, then she got saved because it just so happened that God had a plan for my life, and it just so happened that he got, had to get a hold of a 19-year-old girl in 1975 so that in 2018 I could be living out my calling and my purpose. You are here because of an it just so happened moment. Because God picked you, and God has a plan for you, and God chose you. God, God searched out Rahab. She wasn't looking for them. She, it wasn't on her radar, but God sought her out in the middle of her darkest moment, in a place of likely her greatest sin and shame and guilt and condemnation. God was looking for her. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says, The Son of Man came to, you know the answer, what did he come to do? Seek. He came to seek and to search you out. You might not even be a Christian in the room this morning. Guess what? It's over. He sought you out. He brought you here because it doesn't matter what your past looks like. He brought you here because he sought you out because he's got something planned for your future. John chapter 15 verse 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. So that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Check that. That's Jesus talking. He says, listen, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Now, you're not just chosen, but then you're also appointed. So you're not chosen for no reason. You're ch to be appointed is to be put in a position once you're chosen, you're also appointed by God to have responsibility, to have destiny, to play a part in the building of his kingdom. Like you've been chosen and anointed. Chosen and anointed. No, God doesn't just give you a picture. He gives you a purpose. You've been chosen by him. So the king of Jericho, you know, they've got, they're not stupid. They're keeping an eye on the Israelites and they, they know that some spies have snuck into the city. 
And so he actually sends some of his goons to Rahab's place. And, um, you know, I'm sure they knew the way there. And, and they, they show up at Rahab's and they bang on the door. And she comes to the door and say, hey, there's a couple of spies here from the army across the river. Where are they? Rahab, quick on her feet, hasn't, she's not really saved yet. So she lies to them. And she, she says, well, they were here. But I sent them away, and they've left the city. They're headed in that direction. Chase them now as fast as you can. And so they do. They buy it, and they start running after her. And, and, you know, all the while Rahab knew that she had hidden the spies on her roof. And so after the the guards leave, she goes up to have a little chat with the spies. Like, she's got to figure out what's going on. She goes up. It says in Joshua chapter 2, verse 8, Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt, uh, for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon. And and that, that means that's one of the kings and one of the armies they fought, which actually means warriors. And Og, which means giants, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now, I want you to just, I, I want you to notice how powerful this exchange is. Because God's reputation is growing in Jericho. So they're not even there yet. The Israelites haven't moved in. God hasn't taken down the walls. None of that. And, and Rahab, our, our, our resident prostitute, says, hey, we're all freaking out here. We heard about the Red Sea. We heard about the kings of the Amorites. God is serious business. And, and, and this is not just, these are not insignificant moments she's referencing. Understand the implication. Like the Red Sea was 40 years before this day. This is, this is something that has been growing. I mean, this isn't like a recent history. This is 40 years after the fact. She's saying, whoa, we know that when God wants to do something, he'll make a way to do it. We know that when God wants to get you somewhere, he'll make a way for you to get there. We know that when God wants to bring a miracle, he'll use whatever you've got in your hand to bring a miracle. Like, we know this about God. We know that when a warrior stands in the way of someone who follows God, that God will take them down. We know that when giants get in the way of people who love God, that that's nothing for God, that he'll completely destroy the giants. We've seen him make a way. We've heard that he takes down opposition. We know that he can remove giants. And quite frankly, we're freaking out. (laughs) Rahab has a much stronger revelation of who God really is than some of the people sitting in this room. Because see, if you and I could get a revelation of the fact that God will make a way when you don't see another way, that God stands for you when everyone else stands against you, when God will take down the giants of depression and anxiety and lust and addiction and loneliness and fear, like if you really understand that, it'll change the way you live. And it changes Rahab. Because she, I mean, she believes it. She says, my heart was like we're melting in fear over here. But then look at at what she says. It's a powerful worship statement. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Man, we know he makes a way. We know he takes down opposition. We know he he can cut down the giants. And because we know those things, the only logical conclusion is that your God is the God in heaven and the God on earth. And she, she, I I don't even know if she knows it, but she finds her praise in the middle of her disappointment. God gives you a picture. He's going to give you a purpose. 
but he's also going to give you a praise. And the way you get your praise is you start to remember the things he's done. The way you get your praise and your worship is you start to recount the goodness of God and the miracles of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God over your life. And it's amazing to me that, that she's not even looking, but because she's heard of how great God is, the only logical conclusion she can come to is he must be the God of heaven and of earth. There are some people in your world who are not looking for God right now, but if they would hear about what he's done in your life, the only logical conclusion they would come to is that he must be the God of heaven and earth. I mean, this is powerful. Rahab steps into another dimension on here, uh, here because she begins to profess how great and powerful and amazing God is. And even without even knowing it, she starts to worship. If you want to have a clear picture, if you want to keep your destiny clear, if you want to keep, if you want to keep focused on what God's doing in your life, and if you want to defeat disappointment, you've got to find your praise. You got to find your way to worship. You've got to find your song. You got to get it locked in because worship is how you secure your hope. Yes. See, disappointment is hopelessness to the max. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, the Bible says. Disappointment is just a total vacuum. There's no hope where there's disappointment. But Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm and secure, it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. See, um, in, in the Old Testament, in the temple, um, it was divided into sections. And so um, the, the section right in the middle, like the most, it was the most intimate place of God's presence. Like it was, God was like, he, that's where he hung out. And there was a giant curtain that separated that space called the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple because you couldn't just go in there because God's presence is, is so crazy and so good and so perfect and so wonderful that if sin entered into his presence, like you, you wouldn't make it out. Like you just couldn't go in. But the Bible said that when Jesus was on the cross and he committed his life, committed his spirit to God, said it is finished, that the curtain in the temple was torn that day. And so what happened is because of Jesus, you and I have unlimited access to the deepest places of God's presence. And Hebrews says that the hope that is an anchor for our soul is firm and secure. It enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Every time you worship, you are taking the anchor of your soul and you're driving it into the deepest place of his presence. Every, every time you take an opportunity like we did this, today... We come into a room like this, whatever location you're at, and there's corporate worship. I mean, we're singing songs together. We're experiencing the Lord together. We're in his presence together. Every time you take advantage of those moments, you are saying, God, I don't want my hope to be in anyone else. I don't want my hope to be anywhere else. I'm going to step through the curtain again. I'm going to step into the Holy of Holies, into the deepest, most intimate place of your presence, and I'm going to lock my anchor in there. And see, can I just encourage you? You've got to take every chance you get to secure your hope. Because see, in the middle of a storm, it's really hard to drop an anchor. So right now, if you're not feeling disappointed and you're not feeling discouraged, worship even harder. If, if things are good for you right now, then recognize who made them good and worship him because of that. And, and take every chance. That's why we're doing 21 days of prayer. We're starting every single day right now, 6 a.m. of the worship service. Because you know what? I don't know what 2018 is going to bring. But I'm committed to the picture. I'm committed to the purpose of God in my life. So I'm going to take every single moment, every single opportunity. And I'm showing up at 6 and I'm worshiping. I don't even care what the songs are. It doesn't matter how, how I feel, how tired I am. Because I know I'm locking my anchor in so that when storms come, my anchor is already secure. Where's your anchor? See, you gotta, you gotta worship to drop your anchor. She finds her praise. Martin Luther King said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Accept finite disappointment, that's gonna happen, but don't lose infinite hope. The only way to not lose infinite hope is to keep it secured in the deepest place of God's presence. All finite disappointment's gonna come. You know what I was thinking, even as 
Pastor Quincy was talking this morning about our, our friend who went to be with the Lord yesterday. You know, the beautiful thing about hope is you can hurt and hope at the same time. See, hope doesn't mean you're not hurting. Hope for that family doesn't mean they're not hurting. It just means that even in spite of their hurt, they've already got an anchor fastened somewhere. Firm and secure. So it might hurt like hell, but you've got a hope in heaven. It might hurt. Worse than it's ever hurt, but you've got a hope where things never change, where love never wavers. Your hope is an anchor. It goes on. She's finding her purpose, and God's given her her praise. It says, now then, she, man, it's, it's like, this is so, man, I love Rahab. She's a girl who knows what she wants, you know, and she says it. Guys, it's so refreshing. <laughs> a lot of disappointment comes because you just haven't said what you're expecting. But Rahab, she just gets to it. <laughs> she says, now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. Now, I, I want you just to consider what's happening here in this moment. She's hiding the spies. She's, she's now saved their lives. They did not get captured because she, she, she made a good call. She could ask for anything. She could say, hey, um, when you come back, I want you to repay me with gold. And they could have done it because they had gold. She could have said, I want you to repay me with silver. And they could have done it because they had silver. They were about to take over and she knew that. So she could have said, hey, when you come back, I, I want a piece of land. I want some property that's my own. And they could have given it to her. But, but, but she didn't ask for any of those things. The one thing she asked for, could have asked for anything in the, in the known world. They could have delivered it to her. The one thing she says is, hey, I just need to know that my family will be saved. I don't care what else happens. But when you come back, make sure my family lives. And then see, she puts her life on the line for the salvation of her family. Can I just encourage you that once you've, once you've found that God's given you a purpose and, and, and you've got a picture and so he's given you a praise, that the, the next thing God wants to give us is a passion and a passion not just for ourselves but for other people. And so Rahab has a passion for her family. See, the reason this is so important is because it's hard to stay, it's hard to stay disappointed when you're on mission. It's really hard to stay disappointed when you understand that somebody's life might be hanging in the balance on the other side of your obedience. It's hard to stay disconnected and disappointed when you know that God has positioned you to make a difference and to have influence because as disappointing as today might be, my destiny starts again tomorrow. And so it's really hard to stay in that disappointed mindset when you're living with a passion. God will give you a purpose. God will give you a praise. God will give you a passion. She says, I just need my family to be saved. I just want my family to be saved. I just, I just want to get, can I just get as many of my family as I can into the house because I just want them, I just want them to be saved. I'm going to bring them all in here with me and I just, you got to promise me that they're going to be saved and I see in this woman who's just at the beginning of her relationship and her experience with the God of the universe, a desperation for somebody other than herself to be saved. Friends, if we are going to make it through disappointment, you've got to be desperate for people other than just yourself to be saved. you got to get desperate for your family to get saved. You got to be desperate for your neighbors to be saved. You got to be driven to your knees saying, God, don't let anybody else die without knowing you. And if, if that drives you, disappointment won't last for very long. See, and Rahab had baggage and 
and, and she was dysfunctional, and, and she was, I mean, she was a hot mess, but, but it doesn't disqualify you from being an essential part of what God wants to do. And if, 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 if your mess didn't stop God from choosing you, then your mess isn't going to stop God from using you. And so you've got to just get into a position and a place where you're so focused on what he made you for that disappointment won't stop you. You know what's amazing about Rahab? Matthew chapter 1 gives us like the family tree of Jesus. Gives us 42 generations showing that Jesus is actually a relative of Abraham. It just kind of runs the whole list. You know, you know whose name is right in the middle of the list? Rahab. Rahab, the prostitute. Lived on the outside edge of the city, forgotten, marginalized, abused. I mean, that's a, she's right in the middle. She is the great, 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 plus 24 more greats grandma, grandmother of Jesus. Think about how God exceeds your expectations. She says, God, would you just save my family? And he says, hey, I'm going to one-up you. I'm going to use your family to save the entire world. Imagine what God will do with your prayer request. Imagine what God will do with your burden. Imagine what God wants to do through the people that you let your life touch. Man, he just exceeds. That's exceeding above all that we could ask or imagine. And then the, the spies respond, our lives for your lives. The men are her. If we don't tell, if you don't tell what we're doing... We'll treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land. So she let them down by a rope through the window. For the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return. And then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you've tied this scarlet cord in the window. Tie it in the window through which you let us down. And unless you've brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our heads if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we'll be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And as fast as she could, she tied a scarlet cord to the window. Ties a scarlet cord. Scarlet cord. Man, I'd be checking that cord nonstop. I, I'd be Googling how to do like sailor's knots and I don't know, is that a thing? Like nautical knots? Hashtag. And I'd be, I'd be learning how to tie all different types of knots. I'd be like gorilla taping that sucker to the window. I'd be super gluing it. I'd wrap it up around my bed. I'd sleep on it. I'd tie it around. I mean, I, I would make sure that that rope's not going anywhere. It says, tie it up. Bind it. To tie is to, to bind, to, to fasten, to attach to fix to something securely. See, the, the scarlet cord here and throughout Scripture is a picture of the blood of Jesus. It's a symbol here in this story of, of what's about to happen in the New Testament when he would go to the cross and it would be the blood of Jesus and if we would tie ourselves to his sacrifice on the cross, then we'd be saved. And so she, she ties it firmly to her window. Can I just encourage, as long as you are tied to Jesus, and not just tied, not just like a loose knot that you can take off when the situation doesn't really require faith that you can like remove for a certain group of friends that you can just like, dis no, no, no. Like they, she didn't know when they were coming back f to invade. They said it just has to be firmly attached, fixed, locked in, not going anywhere. If you would firmly attach yourself to Jesus, if you would firmly fix yourself to him and the work of the cross, then it doesn't matter what disappointment shows up. God's got you. It doesn't matter what destruction comes into your life. God's got you. It doesn't matter what storms you've got to endure. It doesn't matter what trials you've got to walk through. God's got you. What are you tied to? Because see, when disappointment comes, we start to tie ourselves to different things. It's like, man, I'm, I'm not happy with where I'm at right now. I'm going to, I just, 
I just need to get another d- degree, and I'm going to tie myself to that. I, I just need another job. If I can just tie myself to another job. Man, I, I just need another spouse. I just need to tie myself to another spouse. I need another church, and I need maybe a vacation, and I need, listen, stop tying yourselves to things that move. Stop tying yourselves to things that can't actually sustain the weight of your existence. Tie yourself to the one who can. Because what we really need is Jesus. So God, if he's got a picture for your life, he'll give you a purpose. If he's got a picture for your life, he's going to give you a praise. If he's got a picture for your life, he's going to give you a passion. And if he's got a picture for your life, and he does, he'll give you a path. And the path through 2018, the path through disappointment, the path through to victory on the other side is Jesus. It's always been Jesus. It's always going to be Jesus. He's the only option. He's the only one. Don't look anywhere else. Do not pass go. Just stay here with Jesus. It's always been Jesus. Beautiful thing is the Israelites come in. The walls crumble, but... There's one little part that stays standing long enough that Joshua says, hey, the the walls are down, but go get Rahab and take her and her family outside to safety. And her, just like she prayed, just like she hoped, and her entire family were saved that day because she kept the cord tied. Listen, God will deliver on your destiny. He will. He's going to deliver on your destiny. You might not see it clearly right now because there's disappointment and there's frustration and things have got you down. But I promise you, if you can just know and remind yourself in your heart today that you're chosen uh, and you can remind yourself that there's a reason to worship and you can remind yourself that you're here for a bigger purpose and just what you're seeing, that you got to be passionate about some other. If you can remind yourself that there is a pathway and his name is Jesus, then you can get through anything. Come on, how many are thankful this morning? That God is the one that delivers. Come on, that that God is the one that will see you through. That God is the one that promises something but delivers on his promise. That God has given you the picture and he's going to see it through to completion. I'd like you to bow your heads. We're going to pray together. I feel like there might be some people in the room and you just need a moment with God. You've got some things, some frustrations, some disappointments. And, uh, you know, our prayer team is going to come in a moment. I would just encourage you to come and spend some time with them at all of our locations. Come and connect with a member of our prayer team. But there are also some people here today, and you've got your life tied to some things that aren't leading you anywhere good. You're tied to your own ambitions. You're, maybe you're tied to a career. Maybe you're tied to a stub, substance. Maybe you're tied to a person. You're looking in, in all the wrong places for hope. And, and God brought you here. It just so happened that you'd be here today. And Jesus is here today because he's been searching for you. So I'm going to count to three. And to all the searchers that are watching and listening, stop running. When I hit three, I believe this is your moment just to give your life to Jesus. I'm going to hit three. I want you to slip your hand up. We're not going to embarrass you, but we are going to pray for you. You slip your hand up. And we're just going to believe in that moment that something shifts, that now you're not doing life by yourself, but in that moment, you've now anchored yourself to Jesus. Here we go. To the searchers. One, two, don't run anymore. Nobody's looking. It's a private moment. Three, go ahead, slip up your hand. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so many. Let's do this. I'm going to ask you if you maybe made that decision to follow Jesus today. Maybe it's a recommitment in your heart. Maybe you did it with a raised hand. Would you just repeat this prayer after me? EC, let's pray it together. Say, Jesus, I need you. I tie myself to you. I commit to you. Come into my life right now. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for everybody that made that decision today. We're so incredibly proud of you guys. Come on, we do a little bit better than that.